Hello, Terry here with another episode of the Animation Industry Podcast. I'm especially excited about this episode because I've been personally inspired by today's artist for many, 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 many years, and his name is Mark Spess, and he is a veteran to the claymation community. So if you are beginning in claymation, or you found out how difficult clay can be in stop motion sometimes, and you'd like some expert tips, you're going to want to give this chat a listen because he is an encyclopedia for clay knowledge. And if you're not too familiar with claymation, it's a form of stop motion that utilizes clay as much as possible. So think of Pengu or Wallace and Gromit because absolutely everything in these worlds is made of clay. So I first discovered Mark's work through the short film he was creating called Zombie Pirate Tales back in 2013. And what immediately stood out to me was his incredibly detailed clay characters that are also very reminiscent of the Will Vinton era and he has an amazing talent for sculpting and he's been able to make a career out of it. So since the 90s, he's worked on many claymation spots and commercials, life-size celebrity replicas, horror film props, and so much more. And another thing about Mark is that he's also very active in this community and even runs a site completely dedicated to stop motion. It's called animateclay.com and there are tons of guides for beginners, a great forum to post your work and get feedback, and every week he hosts a live video podcast on YouTube where he also discusses absolutely everything you can think of when it comes to stop motion. So news, tutorials, feedback sessions, and so much more. And on top of all this, Mark also runs an online store where you can get armature kits, puppet supplies, and software, and he's actually created something very special for all the listeners on this podcast today. So if you're looking to buy an armature or a rig or get a copy of some stop motion software, he's made a coupon code which will give you a 10% discount to any of his bendy armatures and rigs and a copy of Stop Motion Pro. And that coupon code is AIP, as in Animation Industry Podcast, and that will give you 10% off if you go to the online store at animateclay.com. And if you do end up purchasing any of his supplies with that coupon code, you're also supporting this podcast. So I encourage you to check that out. And I will include all this information in the description of this podcast, so don't worry if you missed anything at all. And now moving on, today I want to talk mainly about claymation with Mark because it is such a very, 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 very niche sort of stop motion that not a lot of people have touched. And usually studios these days, even the stop motion ones, focus on puppet animation versus claymation. And yet claymation is personally my favorite form of stop motion. And if you've been following my work over the years, you'll know that I've made dozens I think I've made something like 60 short claymation films. So, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. How are you? Doing really, really great, Ashley. Thanks for having me on, and uh, that was a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> great. Um, so I do want to talk all about claymation and kind of your career path. First of all, how did you end up down this path of claymation and sculpting in the first place? Well, um, as a small kid, uh, I always loved to sculpt. And uh, ever since I was in probably about first or second grade, uh, actually we had this uh, this art teacher, and uh, her name was Miss George, and you know it was it's kind of funny to say, but she had this uh, this piece of clay one day, and she's like, we're all gonna you know sit down and sculpt some uh, some characters or you know flowers or butterflies or whatever you want to sculpt, and uh, so she took this yellow piece of clay, and you know it's like a small ball. And she pinched the head. Um, she pinched out a little tail and like little feet and stuff. And uh, you know, as a as a small kid, this ash, you know, it blew me away that you can take something and create something like that out of it. Um, so uh, as a small kid, you know, I, I really love sculpting and trying to make little heads and things like that, and and castles with people in it, and um, just kind of using my imagination and. Uh, so in the mid '80s, uh, Will Vinton Productions was really big. Um, what they did was they made like the California Raisins and uh, a lot of TV commercials and stuff like that. And uh, so that really inspired me to, you know, take what I was good at, which was sculpting, and try and bring it to life. And uh, you know, pretty much that was it. Um, and so uh, after a while, uh, there were some people that were from the studio. There was a, a guy at the studio called um, Mike McKinney, and uh, he went to this place called the Magic House in St. Louis. And uh, so I went there, and he had like a stash of um, actual puppets, and he had some tapes, uh, uh, videos, and things like that. He said, uh, you know, do you have any of your work? So I brought some pictures, and he saw it, 
and he was really inspired that you know I could actually make characters you know similar to what I saw on TV and um, so he's like well you know are you interested in going to Portland and I said you know what's in Portland and he said that's the uh, the home of uh, Wolverton Productions so uh, he invited me out there and I, I flew out there and uh, got to uh, talk to some of the animators and, uh, and and see some of the sets and um, there was like California Raisins there was the Claymation Easter special there was the uh, the Domino's Pizza Noid and uh, and stuff like that and so um, then he's like well let's go upstairs and you can see this sort of secret uh, project and of course I was intrigued and uh, we went upstairs and there was this thing called the frog prints they were working on and um, so I checked it out and uh, you know walking through like a hall of puppets there are probably about maybe a hundred puppets on the wall and like various stages of completion and whatnot and uh, so I checked all these puppets out and realized like that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life you know it was so inspiring and uh, so from there um, I got to meet, meet like uh, John Ashley and Webster Colcord and uh, other animators and um, through them they were able to get me in touch with Gentleman Films in Charlotte North Carolina and then uh, from there you know I got my first job and uh, the rest is kind of history. That Easter special claymation is like one of my all-time favorites so I can't even imagine what it'd be like to see that the original set so that's awesome. Um, yeah. So so looking back like uh, you've been pretty influenced by some of the masters of claymation. Like, what has been the highlight for you through all this time and, and your career and everything? So, um, so Will Vinton was definitely like my biggest inspiration. Um, Ray Harryhausen films, of course. Um, Willis O'Brien, who made uh, King Kong from the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, those all kind of inspired me, just the way that you know the, the puppets moved and kind of came to life. Um, just seeing that to me was was really magical, and uh, you know when I was a small kid, um, CG was not as big as it is today, and uh, so with the advent of like Jurassic Park, um, pretty much uh, everything was done you know with, by hand. Like Phil Tippett, for example, did the uh, the Empire Strikes Back stop motion, mm -hmm. and uh, one of my favorite scenes is like where the the Tauntaun kind of runs on uh, through the snow, and then there's like the Adats. And uh, and and that Walker and so forth. So did you actually end up seeing like the? I I think it's funny you call them ad ads. I've only ever known them as ATATs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you end yeah. up seeing that stuff? So uh, I did go to Phil uh, Phil Tippett Studios and uh, see a lot of their work. Uh, probably around, I'm gonna say, what year was that? Man, that was right before Starship Troopers. Um, oh. I forget the year, but uh, it was a long time ago, and I did get to see a lot of the puppets and things like that. Um, and uh, and it was really inspiring. And they had actually the the large, um, you know, ED ED two hundred nine, I think it is, like the, the larger puppet, uh, yeah. full size, like on the wall. Um, wow. So yeah, I mean, Phil Tippett was, is also a huge inspiration for me. Uh, you know, some of the like if you've ever seen um, Howard the Duck, which is uh, a George Lucas film, which is little known. Uh, it's actually kind of a crappy film, but uh, there's some stop motion in there. And it's some of the best stop motion you'll ever probably see. Um, yeah, Phil Tippett is really, he's like a god, you know. <laughs> yeah, true. So can you go over some of the like highlights of your career then? Like some of the projects you've worked on over the years and stuff? Sure. So, I mean, pretty much uh, the stuff that I've done is kind of, uh, it's not well known. Um, so I did some stuff for Warner Brothers. For example, uh, some Warner Brothers station IDs for Latin America. Uh, also worked for the, the Cartoon Network. We did uh, the No Brainer Afternoon uh, Station IDs. Um, so stuff that you probably you know, like, you've heard of the Cartoon Network, you've, you've, you know Warner Brothers and all that, but you've probably never seen the work. Um, the Henry Cycle campaign. That's like a regional clan animation campaign in uh, North Carolina. Um, I've worked for for Disney doing their sweet tart candies. Right. So I actually like sculpted those um, for many years. Um, what else? Uh, I worked for uh, Pumpkin Masters, and they, they used to be called Trend Masters. They had like a, uh, a toy making division in St. Louis. And uh, what they would do is they would sort of like design their, uh, their toys there. And then also they had a whole entire crew that, that would film the, 
the toys being used by kids to, to you know make TV commercials and stuff. So I worked with them for a while. Um, so yeah, but nothing like uh, nothing super famous. Just a lot of small projects everywhere, pretty much. So that's okay. So it sounds it sounds like you've hopped around a lot too. Like how long were you on one project, say for like Cartoon Network versus um, like Disney versus Warner Brothers? Right. So my sculpting jobs usually lasted the longest. Like I probably sculpted for uh, for Natoli Engineering, who worked for uh, to make the dyes for the candies, and uh, so I sculpted their characters for maybe like five or six years. Um, that was like the longest stretch job for me. Um, and then there's other jobs like for uh, for Henry Cycle, where we did stuff for maybe like six months at a time, uh, sometimes like three months. Um, I'm trying to think like when I worked for Webster, I think I was there for maybe, um, I'm going to say like two months or so. Um, other jobs just for days. Oh, my gosh. You know, um, it's... So how did you like get a content? How did you get these jobs like did you apply or were you just well known or what was that yeah so so I had my website um, when I worked for Webster Colcord he uh, he taught me quite a lot about stop motion mm. um, because he had worked for Wolf Wolf Productions and he worked on the uh, California Raisins and uh, clay on glass stuff for Disney and all kinds of stuff um, also like Mike Rosinski from Gentleman Films taught me a lot and uh, so after a while, like I, I did all these kind of uh, freelance projects and, you know, I, I realized that there's no security in it after a while uh, because, like I right. said, you know, you're on one job for two weeks, one time for six months, one time for, you know, three months, four months, something like that. And uh, and I was like, well, this is kind of not good, <laughs> yeah. you know, and uh, so I'm like, well, what can I do to, you know, maybe make some uh, some money and have stability at the same time, but still do stop motion work. Yeah. So, uh, so I guess uh, in August of 2001, I made animateclay.com, and um, actually I made it before that. Actually, I made it uh, probably in like 1999 or so. Oh my gosh! We on, the internet uh, was born. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so it's kind of a funny story. Uh, AOL.com is is sort of notorious for being like what everybody used back then, and they would send out like these these cheap CDs to to join their service. Right. And uh, so we got like tons of these CDs, and and we decided to try it. And uh, so we got on the internet, and part of AOL back then was that they gave you like a free website. Um, so this was like little known to most people, and uh, so I I made my first clay animation web page and it was the very first web page on clay animation ever made so oh my god um, yeah wow. it's like i had no competition back then right uh and uh so i made it and it became really popular because it was the only one you know not be not because the content was super amazing but um people had a yearning to learn like how do you make puppets and how do you make uh props and, and all that so uh, so after that, uh, it went from like AOL to uh, Fortune Cities and then Spree.com. And, you know, there are all these companies that I had it on for a while. <clears throat> and then I got my own domain name. And uh, a friend of mine told me how, you know, taught me how to uh, make a server and put it all on there and like uh, do your SEO stuff, like what you do and right. uh, those kinds of things. So and, how uh, many people do you think have visited your website over the years if it's like, the first one ever on claymation and teaching yep. stop motion online. It, it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. <laughs> yeah. It, I remember going lot. on it like way back in the early 2000s. Like I would literally like we had dial up and I would scour the internet for any stop motion or like claymation related thing I could find. So yeah, I'm, I it was like one of the first websites I came across too. So that's awesome. Yeah. And uh, and it's it's a lot of fun for people to uh, to kind of go there now and check it out and learn and, and whatnot. But there's so many uh, there's like Facebook pages, there's uh, other websites, there's blogs. You know, it's it's kind of buried in a, a massive information now. But uh, at the time, it was really big. So that's kind of yeah. how I got a lot of work. Uh, so you're asking, and and just because I I was well known from the website, and also because I had uh, I had made some films and things like that on my own. Um, you know, people took took interest, and I had some friends also 
uh, you know, who had gone, I had gone to high school with, who had uh, connected with me when they had gotten jobs in studios too. So it's just a mix of, of different, um, you know, conditions in my life that kind of led to just doing odd jobs everywhere. Gotcha. So, like, one of the reasons I didn't get into claymation when I came out of high school, even though I'd done a bunch of stuff, was that I didn't see any opportunity in the marketplace. So it sounds it sounds kind of similar, a similar path, but you've been able to keep doing it all this time on the side or, like, projects here and there. Um, so maybe, like, how did it feel knowing that there wasn't a lot of opportunity going into claymation, but then still striving to do it all that time? Like. What kept you going? Well, I mean, I just love the the art, and I love sculpting, and I love to uh, try and bring things to life. And you know, real life has gotten in the way for me for for many years. Yeah. Um, you know, like I I got married, I had a kid. Uh, my wife lost her mother. I lost my mother. Then she lost her father, and we moved three times. You know, uh, since I you know like started Zombie Pirates, for example. So that project took like 10 years to, to complete, uh, you know, but so and, and trying to make, you know, a living and, and money and all that as well. So, uh, you know, it, it's been tough, but I love the art and I, I just stick with it uh, and try to um, continue as much as possible because it's just fun. So um, maybe some advice to younger me when I was coming out of high school and I completely like gave up on stop motion. I like mentally blocked it off. What would you say to me? I mean, now that I'm getting back into it, but like yeah. with your experience, what would you say to somebody who doesn't see opportunity and is going to give up? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, a lot of people like yourself um, fall into that. And um, I think we were going to kind of talk about some of the, the pitfalls of stop motion. And, and this kind of might be a good uh, segue into that because, sure, yeah. um, you know, a lot of people... Uh, lose interest and inspiration and um, a lot of times th some of the biggest um, things that people do is that they'll they'll kind of get an idea in their head of like an epic feature film and then they'll realize after you know they do like the storyboards and the character designs and they make some puppets and then they get to this you know the part where they're about to make a stage or something and 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 they're thinking you know, I haven't really done a lot, but this has already taken me like eight months. And uh, just the, the amount of time that it takes to do it is is something that a lot of people are discouraged by. And uh, so, like, my suggestion for beginners is to just kind of start out small. Um, don't think of, like, making an epic film uh, or maybe even a series of films. Like, stick with one short film and uh, and complete it. And then trying to move on to the next after that as soon as you can, um, because sometimes if you have like a lull in in your, uh, um, you know, in, in your time where you're just kind of hanging around and uh, hanging out with friends and stuff like that, and you sort of forget things, uh, you know, it's easy to kind of get away from it. But you know, if you stick with it, you can get better at it, and it's more fun the better you are. Um, if that makes sense. Because it's, it's kind of like a video game where you, know, you start out where you don't know how to play it and you really stink at it and you die all the time and you're just like, I give up. You know, but if you get good at it, you know, it's more fun. Uh, that's kind of like the same, same concept behind it, uh, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. And, and I think that's really good advice because um, I often see, you know, stop motion looks so great and feels so good to watch after like a finished product. But I sometimes see people, you know, they spend a lot of time thinking about what kind of character they want to make. They design like this very intricate, detailed character. They get all the expensive molding and the armatures and, yep. and like all that stuff. And then by the time they've gotten to the animation, you know, either they've burned out or they haven't realized what it actually takes. And if they end up finishing it, you see... Sometimes I feel sad because I see this beautiful film, set-wise, puppet-wise, but then the animation is like so choppy, and and they've like not hit the fundamentals when it comes to like a simple walking or like a like a ball bounce or something like that. So I think getting into just animating as fast as possible can help you understand what it's actually like, because because it's about enjoying the process, I guess. Like nobody's gonna get into stop motion if they don't love it. Like. <laughs> 
Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, there, there's there's that. Uh, you're right about that. Like a lot of people will just kind of, you know, rush through the animation, for example. Uh, another thing that another pitfall is that people uh, will go on the internet and they'll research stop motion. Um, they'll go to like, like stopmotionanimation.com is also a great site uh, yes. by Anthony Scott, yep. which I'm sure you're you're familiar with. Oh, yes. uh, <laughs> and, uh, there's some like uh, some really great YouTube channels out there, but you might go on these places and and see like what people are saying. And one of them is always like, you know, what is the best camera I can buy? And right. You know, somebody will usually reply, well, my Canon DSLR is. And then you go on, like, eBay or the camera store, and and the camera is, like, $800, you know. So, you know, it, and then you go, well, I want to make an armature. So how do you make an armature? Well, you need a really good drill press. So what does that cost? Oh, that's, like, 50 bucks. That's not too bad. And you're like, well, um, I need to uh, I need to silver solder all these, uh, you know, steel balls into the rods. What do I need? Oh, you need propane and you need a little torch. That's like, you know, 25 bucks. And then you get through this whole entire list. And by the end of the list, you realize that it costs you like $2,000 just to get set up with the, the software, the cameras, the equipment. Then that's not even including like the materials. Like what do you, I need like clay. I need silicone. I need uh, UltraCal 30. I need the paints. I need the lights. I need the light gels. So um, people also fall into that trap where, they're like, I'm just gonna buy all this stuff all at once and essentially, you know, go broke. And right. then they realize I don't have any money. <laughs> you know. So that's like an extremely common problem. Uh, you see it all the time. So uh, I always suggest that, you know, if you're gonna start in stop motion, just get like an old laptop, spend like a hundred dollars, go to a, a, a computer place that fixes computers and get an old one. Um, get some free software, get like a $10 uh, web camera, and then uh, get like some clay and some aluminum uh, wire for armatures. And then, uh, you know, see uh, see what you can do with that. Make a story out of like a simple character. Like you don't have to have a complicated background, just have like paper back there and uh, and go for it. And and make the film from beginning to end and uh, and see what you can learn because... You know, if you spend all that money on a, a studio setup and then you realize it's not for you, you're kind of in the hole. So um, always kind of start slow. <laughs> Don't yeah. think too big. And, and that's pretty much uh, you'll be good. I think. there, are, Yeah, I think that's really good. I think there are two key things that you kind of touched on. One is like that's kind of the beauty of claymation, because I, I mean, I started with dollar store clay and that was good enough to create a character, create a short little film like that's all you need right um yeah and the second one is like why what why are you buying all this stuff in the first place like is it for a personal project are you looking to create like a business um so if it is for business like i would recommend as well like learn how to do it first before you end up spending all this money because like i think it's super tough to make money from claymation and maybe you can speak to that a little bit more like if somebody wants to turn this into a business like myself for instance where how do i get contacts like how do i uh promote my services like you've kind of done over the years yeah so uh so i tried to do this before um kickstarter and indiegogo came out mm. um those are two really great sites but uh what i did is i had a blog uh, my zombie pirate tale blog and what I did was I would post on there as much as I could, like maybe uh, once every other day, you know, sometimes once a week. Um, but I always tried to make sure that I had a, a community that could I could I could keep up to date with my projects. And uh, I would post pictures of like the, the characters, the sets, you know, the armatures, the molds, um, and then I'll, of course like uh, video of behind the scenes footage and things, things like that. So. So like Patreon is is kind of associated with that now. So somebody sort of figured out that that's a good idea and uh, turned those into legitimate web pages um, that are you know well known. Uh, so you know nowadays I would just go with that. I would go with Patreon or Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, and also before you do that, I would try to promote your project just to kind of get some uh, feedback from people and see if they are interested. So. It's really easy to do that with a, a blogger web page 
uh, or on a Facebook uh, page as well. So mm-hmm. Facebook has pages. And right now, Facebook is kind of taking over like message boards and, and all that kind of stuff as it is. So, you know, I would definitely go with that, uh, make a page and just see if you get some likes and uh, and some uh, and some followers. Yeah, I mean, uh, Instagram is kind of what I use lately, and it's so easy to use tags and, and follow other stop motion artists and they end up following you back because it's such a small community that they're interested. So. Yeah, totally agree. Um, in regards to zombie pirates, uh, it took yeah. you a, many years to make an episode. And I remember like going on your website all the time because you were posting quite frequently, but you weren't posting that much animation because you weren't at that stage yet. Are you going to actually uh, make some more episodes out of that? Yeah, so uh, I am not. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's, well, I won't say never because there's always a possibility, <laughs> you know, in the future if something comes along. Yes. But uh, but for the most part, no. And uh, you know, for for many reasons. Uh, so that that project was kind of a nightmare project in, at the start. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but uh, I actually had a partner on that project for a while, and things kind of fell apart uh, early, about after two years. We uh, had uh, we built up a story. And uh, to make a long story short, um, there was money involved, and the person that I was working with um, had made some accusations about me that weren't true, like oh, that no. I was uh, hoarding like millions of dollars and stuff. Like it was really crazy stuff. And I had uh, secured funding to make it, and unfortunately, I had to give it up because my uh, my partner was kind of kind of lost his mind, and. Uh, I don't want to get into it too much because it's, I don't want to hurt that person. Yeah. But, uh, oh my gosh. But they, they did have some issues. <laughs> so what, it, so like, what are you going to do with all the sets and stuff now that you um, haven't been working on it in a while? Well, uh, I do have some of the sets left. I have all the puppets and I have the molds. Um, everything's like in a nice box. <laughs> Most yeah. of it fit in a small, not actually a, a no, it's not a box, but a, a cabinet. Um, so I still have it. And, um, I mean, there's a possibility I might resurrect it in the future, but right now my space is limited, gotcha. and my ideas are really big for that, so I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. So are you working on any claymation or sculpting projects right now? Yep. Uh, so I am, and uh, I'm working on a film called Bad Apples, and it is a experimental stop-motion film. It's oh. um, So I don't know if, you're, if your audience has ever seen any clay on glass work, Yes. But uh, if you have, uh, you will know that there are there, there's a setup that people use in stop motion for this particular form of stop motion, and it's it's like a uh, a table, and it has a camera that points down at the ground, and there's layers of glass that are roughly um, I'm gonna say like maybe six inches or so apart from one another, and there's probably about four or five layers. And what what's done is you use a camera with really long exposures to get a good depth of field, which gets all the layers in focus. And you make like a head on one layer, you make a body on another layer below that, and arms and legs and, and so forth. And, uh, and you slide everything around on the glass and sort of, uh, it's almost like a cross between three-dimensional animation and two-dimensional animation and so that's what i'm doing now but i'm using a program called moho 13. so what i've done is i've uh i've made all the characters in the traditional way but then i photograph them and then i uh what i do is i go in photoshop and i remove all of the the information around the uh the different parts so they're transparent and in this case it was a green screen and then uh from there, uh, import it into that program, and it looks like the traditional, uh, you know, way of animating. But you get a lot of extra perks, like motion blur. Um, you can um, you can use bones and things to to animate, and you can get uh, easing in and easing out all um, automatically, wow. as well as uh, fine tuning your animation really well. Um, so if you have like something that's super teeny tiny, like I'm, I'm animating a worm inside of an apple. So normally it would be really hard with my big fingers to do that, but with with the new technology, it's actually kind of easy. Um, so I'm just kind of trying to take advantage of the newer technologies and uh, 
It also does take up a lot of space, which is a, a big thing. So are you actually animating in real life or are you doing the animation in the program then? So in this case, it's in the program. Uh, oh, it's a bit okay. different than traditional stop motion. It's a uh, sort of a hybrid uh, project. Gotcha, cool. Um, well, I have a number of questions about just glass animation. Like, how do you not have the camera reflected back in from the glass? Yeah, so uh, so the way that's done is, um, so there's actually a few tricks. Uh, like when I work for Gentleman Films, one of the tricks that we, we did to, to um, get a, around that was um, actually, there, there's there's twofold problems. There's the the lighting, and there's also reflections of stuff in the layers of glass in front of you, yeah. or at the at the top layer onto the lower layer. So what you would do is you would have the lights kind of to the side, aiming at the center. So you would have them at a lower angle than a, than too high because you would see them as a reflection. And then on the bottom of your flat characters. So what we did there was we had um, they were doing cell animation the traditional way at that time. So that's where you take um, acetate and you, you use special paints on there to paint them. And those paints are made of vinyl and it sticks really well to clay. So we got some uh, some cartoon uh, color um, you know cell paints and we would, would paint the backs of all the characters black. So no light can reflect from the bottom parts of them and, and be seen by the camera. Oh my gosh. So what if you happen to, I don't know, need to morph some of the clay? Do you have to take it off, paint it, and then put it back on every time? Um, well, that was pretty much what we would do is we would, um, well, what we did at Gentleman Films anyway was we hired a cell animator to animate everything. And then, so we would have, um, like maybe, let's say the scene required um, like 15 different replacements. So we would take each piece of paper and see where the, the outline was. Um, then we would take the clay, put it on the paper, kind of trace around it, or actually put the put the paper on the clay itself, sorry, and trace around it to make an outline on the clay. And then we would cut it out, and then we would then use that to you know sculpt within those boundaries. Um, so every time something would be morphed, it would be actually a, a you know a legitimate replacement part, fully new, you know, from the, the previous version. Um, oh my gosh. So uh, for, for your listeners out there, if you want to uh, do this quickly, what we would do is we would we would take uh, dental alginate and make small molds of all these parts. And then we would melt clay in a double boiler and like spit out like 10 different parts and then, uh, you know, manipulate those as well um, so that the shapes and the volume of the clay was the same. I mean, it was it was really complicated. <laughs> Yeah, I never actually thought of melting clay into a mold before. Um, does how does that work? Like, you just pour the melted clay in, and it hardens, and then it's good. Yeah, so uh, it's actually really common in clay animation to to melt clay and to to use molds. Um, so for like zombie pirate tails, I used exclusively uh, silicone, and I would make molds of the heads that I that I sculpted, and then. Uh, so the, the process is basically where, um, so I, I would use, um, I was using Van Aken clay, but there's other clays that are oil-based you can use as well to try this. But um, so what you do is you, you have a, a pot filled with water, or you can have a pan. And uh, what you do is you take a pot and put it in that pan, usually with like a coil of wire under it, so the, the pan and the pot aren't like making contact. Right. And then you heat it up, and the water gets hot, but it doesn't get over 212 degrees after the boiling point is reached. So that's just hot enough to, to melt the clay, sort of like melting butter. And uh, after it's melted, you can actually you know mix in other colors with it. Um, so like Wolverton Productions and, and at Jolliman Films, what they would do is they would have a, a one pound bar of clay, which has lines drawn on it, then they would sort of draw lines in, in the opposite direction to make like a grid. And then they would measure out like, okay, if we want to have uh, raisin purple, we would uh, have, let's say, um, five, like six cubes of blue and two of red and one of, you know, white or something. And they would write these formulas down, uh, heat up their water, put 
the, the pot on top and the clay, stir it all together, and you would have kind of a consistency between um, the colors. Uh, and then after that, what they would do is they would pour that into a mold. Uh, a lot of times you will want to have a, a mold that's kind of warm so that when the clay hits it, uh, it doesn't leave like little ripples because it sometimes cools as soon as it hits it. So if you heat it up in the oven for a bit, uh, it's, a, it's a much cleaner process. Uh, and you can do this around like armatures so that the armatures stick inside there. Uh, or like put uh, like ping pong balls in there to make it lightweight. And uh, you pop it out after, you know, a few hours. Or if, you're, if your character is really complicated, you want to actually freeze the clay. So after it's melted, you put it in the freezer. It turns rock hard, like literally. <laughs> Yeah. And then you, you take it out of your mold, and it comes out perfectly clean. You let it uh, warm back up, and you can animate it. You are uh, blowing my mind right now because I sit there for like an hour with aching hands, <laughs> mixing clay manually. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, that's not bad. That's not bad. I mean, it's... it's but not bad. I never... I mean, I, I never thought to actually melt the clay in a pot and stir it together so i'm gonna have to do that <laughs> next time so but okay so we're just answering a bunch of like highly technical claymation questions maybe we should just get into that because i have another i have a number of questions specifically about using clay in stop motion and and kind of like uh i'd love to get your advice or experience um for instance like the ping pong ball thing that's really i like that a lot i've been using tin foil um inside to make it lighter but a ping pong ball totally makes sense or actually even from the dollar store they have these uh white styrofoam balls i don't know if you've seen them but i commonly use yes well. now th that might uh that might melt uh if it gets too hot though you gotta be careful with those uh um okay so maybe we should just get into uh, a whole bunch of claymation questions um sure. yeah well first of all like what is the advantage of using clay over like a puppet like in a studio setting or just any setting like is it purely aesthetic or from what your experience is, why would you use claymation economically over a puppet, for instance? Right. So uh, first, it is aesthetic. Um, clay has wax in it. So that wax tends to look more like real skin. So if you have characters that are human or uh, like a frog or something like that, it tends to look more realistic. Um, so that's one reason. Um, the other reason is, uh, yeah, it is it is a lot cheaper. So you can literally make a puppet with uh, with like three three components. You could have uh, aluminum wire. So that's how you make the armature. Uh, epoxy putty, which holds the wire pieces together, and clay. That's the only three ingredients you need. Um, so you can make a puppet for literally like I'm gonna say. I mean, if your puppet's one color, if you want to go like to an extreme, uh, you can make one for five bucks. <laughs> you know, so it's a great way to kind of get into stop motion, and it's also great if you know you have a limited budget, or if you want to tell a story uh, without spending, you know, literally, like I said before, you could you could spend thousands of dollars on materials, you know, alone. Um, so if if you watch like a, a like a animation or something and you see Kubo and the two strings and you're like I'm gonna make that kind of puppet and it's really you know it's gonna be really easy and stuff um, well it actually isn't that hard but it's gonna take you forever to do if you want to you know do it at that quality uh, as well yeah so it's just a time saver uh, in a lot of ways too makes sense um, sometimes when I have an armature underneath the clay like the wire ends up sticking out of the clay and then I have to like remold it all the time. Is that pretty common or do you have any other tips for that too? Yeah, so uh, so the, the clay itself will not stick to wire uh, by itself. I mean, it will, but you have to do something. Um, so if you try to take, a, now I should probably um, explain because you're, you might have some listeners from the UK if I recall, right? Yeah. Okay. Where so Arden in the UK, is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in the UK, this doesn't, uh, this is not going to work for you. Uh, but in the US, we have Van Aken clay tune clay, which is really common in uh, hobby shops. Mm -hmm. And you want to take like a propane torch, or you want to uh, take a hair dryer, and you want to um, make like a small ribbon of clay, like a small snake, 
and heat it up until it melts. So when it gets really shiny and it's about to melt, you want to let it drip all over your armature. And then once that happens, uh, the wax in it melts. And like, I don't know if you've ever melted a candle uh, on a table or something and you got to scrape it off. Mm. But the candle itself will not, you know, just, um, it won't stick to a table unless it's melted mm -hmm. uh, to it. So that melting process is what allows that clay to stick to the armature. So you want to, um, you want to uh, melt it to your armature. Now, if you're in the UK, you're going to have uh, new plast clay, which is really common there. And you can't do that because the clay doesn't melt, unfortunately. Um, so like their, their process of making molds, like we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, is to make like a silicone mold, but then they build a, a plaster box around it that's hard. And then they kind of they kind of put their clay in the oven and push it into the mold when it's hot or, or kind of warm and and push it in and push the air out so that it can fit inside there and, and fill all the cracks and, and get the details. So, uh, but uh, so what they want to do in the, for their armatures is they want to take some some thinner, smaller wire, or you want to take some um, aluminum screen door mesh used to repair screen doors, and you want to wrap that around your armature a bit, and then you want to uh, crazy glue that into place. So when you put your new plast over the the armature, the the wire and the mesh will sort of grip it. And it won't allow the uh, the clay to just like 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 you're saying like it'll kind of push into the wire and just fall off of it eventually. Uh, so it's it's a very common problem. Yeah, wow, that makes so much sense. Um, I didn't even know that about Will Vinton clay that it sticks to armatures. Is but I guess that's uh, a key feature of it. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit about clay because uh, I just use dollar store clay, and the reason is because I do so many different characters that only need like to be there for 30 seconds and then I never use them again. So it doesn't like it's not really it doesn't make sense for me to spend all this time and effort making a an armature that I um, with like expensive clay that I won't use for more than like 50 frames where you know I can just deal with it. So yeah. Can you explain kind of the big differences between like dollar store clay that I'm using and like Will Vinton clay and et cetera? Like what are the, some of the um, most common ones that people use and why? Yeah, yeah. So, so there, there is the dollar store clay. Um, there's actually there's actually many brands. Um, there's Craft Smart, which is another one. Um, so the, the dollar store clay is pretty good for general purpose uses, but they use a lot of cheaper ingredients and it's kind of usually smelly. Yes. Um, did you notice that? <laughs> oh, yeah, 100%. And sometimes, depending on, like, I don't know what batch they're selling at the time, like, sometimes the clay is so melty you can't even work with it. Like, it's just, like, goo almost. So I've learned yes. which ones are okay over time. <laughs> yeah, so so Wolven and Clay, uh, Clay Tune, not Wolven Clay, uh, Van Aken Clay Tune Clay is, uh, is generally a good multi-purpose one. But it's more expensive, um, and so in the UK they use new plast. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Ardman Animation does is they will buy up Van Aken clay, and they will mix it with their new plast clay to get um, their clay to be less. Uh, a lot of times the, the clay will crack when it bends, mm. so that's that's really not a good thing. Um, but um, let me think. So what would be like the biggest difference? So I guess consistency, the, you're, you're actually paying more for consistency than anything else with the more expense, expensive brands. Uh, and then there's Puppet Putty, which is made by Don Carlson. And mm -hmm. so that's not actually clay, but it's a kind of, uh, he calls it a putty, which is um, all natural ingredients. And it also does not crack when you bend it. And it's one of the best clays for uh, animating. And some people also take his clay and mix that in with Van Aken clay to make the consistency a little bit smoother. Oh my gosh. So one of the things that, that you're talking about where sometimes the clay is gooey, maybe sometimes it's too hard. Um, a lot of animators will try to manipulate the formula with different ingredients, uh, such as mineral oil. That's, that's a really popular one to mix in with clay if it's kind of hard um, and doesn't smooth well. And uh, sometimes you can mix in, um, what is it, uh, 
I think it's talcum powder. I think that's one of the, the ingredients that Wolvitin used. Um, and that makes it a little bit more firm. So, you know, it's it's really hard to to get anything super perfect for animation. One of my friends uh, used to always complain that, you know, this certain clay is, you know, behaves this way and that that clay behaves that way. And how do we make it perfect every time and everything like that? <clears throat> and my answer to that is, you know, if you stick with one brand of clay over time, you'll yeah. just understand how it behaves and you can adapt to that. Uh, that's what, what I would suggest. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, partially I'm scared to switch to another clay because I'm so used to dollar store clay. Um, yeah. What about Super Sculpty? Uh, because you can like I know that some animators uh, use that. Do you have an opinion on Super Sculpty? Yep, that's like the most expensive way to do it. Um, oh. I mean, actually, uh, so Super Sculpty will work pretty well, um, and but it's mostly used for for baking. So what's what it is is a what they call a polymer clay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also like Fimo and yeah, uh, like true. there's the, the different um, polymer. What's that one brand? Uh, what is it called? Uh, Primo. So Fimo, Primo, Sculpey. Uh, there's a bunch of them. And uh, it's so expensive to use those. And they end up uh, kind of drying out over time. So you can use it for maybe, you know, six months. But if it's in like a hot garage or something that you're animating, uh, a lot of times that it will it will tend to sort of get hard, and it's it's not really great. But um, but at least in the in the short term, it's pretty good. Gotcha, boy. You have like a, you're like an encyclopedia for clay. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so let's talk about like sculpting tools a little bit. So like, um, do you recommend any specific sculpting tools for clay? And I know you said you make a lot of molds, but um, even I guess you have to make the mold from something you sculpted too. So what do you use? Yeah, so I found one tool that I, I found um, on, what was it, BermanIndustries.com. And I found this tool, wow, <laughs> it's it's crazy to think I've had the same tool for so long, but like in the late 90s is when I bought it. Um, oh, wow. What it is is a, a 007 wax spatula. So what it looks like is kind of a, it's kind of like a pencil shape where the end of the pencil was smashed flat into a spoon and the other side is kind of not really at a point but sort of like a boat shape okay. uh, and and that's what i've been using for like that's like my main tool for like 20 years there's other tools i use but that's the one that i use most gotcha and what is that what is what is that tool good for like tiny details i guess or just like overall sculpting or something yeah, like like kind of like what I said with the clay, where you would kind of adapt. Uh, you stick to one thing and you just use it so often yeah. that you know, you know what it's good for and what it's bad for. Uh, and so what it's really good for is for kind of like making the the mouth the mouth shapes uh, mm. of puppets, as well as uh, around the eyes and the ears, and just general sculpting really. Uh, but that that's a really important tool. But there's actually one tool that is really important. Uh, that you never hear of, that people never really talk about it very much, and that is a uh, a paintbrush. So oh. um, most people don't think of like sculpting clay with the paintbrush, um, but this is one of the tools that they used at uh, Wolvitten Productions, and John Ashley taught me to use. And John uh, came from Mexico and worked in uh, Portland for many years at the studio. In fact, uh, I believe he's still there now. Um, and he did the carrot sequence in Meet the Raisins. If uh -huh. you've ever ever seen that sequence, it's like one of the the best uh, grouper sequences of animation you'll ever see, pretty much. <laughs> uh, so so what he showed me was, you take a um, a small film canister, which not many people have these days, but you could take like a small jar, and you you shove like you know two or three paper towels inside there. And then you take mineral okay. oil, you take that mineral oil and pour it all over the entire thing and let it soak up um, until it's not saturated, but it it's like um, if you take your finger and put it in there, you'll get a, a very thin co uh, coating of oil on your finger. So if you can do that and not have it dripping and not dry, uh, you know you're good. And then you take a... Uh, 
one of these paint brushes, which, um, so if I'm going to describe it, the, the paintbrush bristles are about maybe half the, the length of your pinky nail, if it was short. Okay. All right. So that means that the bristles are kind of soft, but they're also firm at the same time. They're, it's kind of like, it's really kind of hard to explain on a podcast without you seeing it. <laughs> but uh, but that's the general gist of it. And then you take that paintbrush and then you you, uh, you rub that oil from, from the paper towel onto the brush. And then you can get into all your details with that, like around the eyes and inside the ears, the nostrils, the lips, the creases. Uh, because your fingers simply can't get into those places because they're too big uh, when you're making yeah. puppets. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned like your your tool can is like good for sculpting mouths and stuff. Can okay, so can you go through the process of like re-sculpting a mouth for lip syncing? Like I always just use replacement mouths, but how do you re-sculpt the face every single time? Yeah, yeah. So there's different ways to do it. Uh, so let's see. When I worked for Gentleman Films, um, they did it. Let's see, they did it the traditional way. So I, I didn't animate uh, Henry Cycle on that project, but a guy named Tom Smith did. And uh, the way that he did it was he just took a tool and reshaped the mouth every frame. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so like if, if it's 24 frames per second, uh, what he would do is try to aim for a certain expression after so many frames and then just literally like take a tool and cut the face like a knife and close the mouth and then uh, add some clay where the, the gap was and then, you know, just re-sculpt it and re-smooth it until he got what he wanted. Uh, that's the traditional way. And there's the robot chicken way, which is where you can make the, the face smooth, yeah. but make little, uh, little mouths that are press on. Yep. So if you've ever seen Robot Chicken, you know you know what I'm talking about. They're sort of flat. They look like they're paper, like cutouts. Yes. Um, yeah, that's one way to do it. The the final way to do it, and the way that I tried to do it on Zombie Pirates, and I didn't know anybody that did this before I did it. And then uh, someone told me that they actually did this for a project called The Adventures of Mark Twain at Wolven Productions for um, for Mark Twain. But, I didn't know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. Cool. Yeah, so you've been watching. Uh, so what I did is I, I sculpted a head of a character, like my captain character. And then what I did is I took an X-Acto knife and I cut the mouth off so it's kind of like a wedge shape. And then what I did from there was I made a mold of it, and then I would pour in clay into the mold and make multiple faces of the same face, which was a neutral expression. And then from there, uh, I would re-sculpt, uh, I think I did nine different replacement faces for him. Mm -hmm. I mean, that nine faces is enough to pretty much have him say anything. Uh, and then uh, I made molds of that, and then I could have, like, you know, anytime I wanted to have, like, the, um, they call them phonemes, I think. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Uh, so, like, the, the ooh shape, or the, you know, the, the ver, or the burr, or whatever. Uh, like there's different expressions and I could just make a mold, uh, cast it, pop it on there and take it off and, and just do that and have them talk, um, which worked out really well. But I had to smooth the seam line out where the transition was from the original face to the, the cast face. Yeah. So it's a little bit complicated, but it, it looks pretty good. It's probably the most economical one for the best looking effect, too. Like I've seen I've seen other people hide it by like the character has a mustache or something else, you know, like that sits on top. Yep. Yeah, one of my characters, I did that. Uh, his name was Ruble, Ruble the Russian, and yeah, that's yeah, one yeah. of the tricks. Yep. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about like how, because so, like gravity is a factor in this. Like if you're replacing very heavy clay mouths and stuff, how do you not have the character fall over? Like what is going on there? <laughs> right. Yeah. So... So this is uh, this is the big question because everybody always complains that you know I try to make my character walk and they took a step and then their head fell off and their arms fell off and you know it's like okay you know here's what you do so uh, I always explain it to them <laughs> and uh, the the way I explain it is that uh, what they did at Wolven in Productions uh, it's like I've told the story a million times but. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> I love that you have Will Vinton Productions experience. Like that is amazing in itself. 
yeah, it's just from hanging out with the people that work there, really. Uh, they taught me so much, uh, particularly uh, Webster Colcord. He's, he's a really great guy, too. But uh, so if you ever watch any of the older claymation films, you'll notice that there is this really strange way that they photograph things. And that is that they never photograph below the waist when a character walks around. Yeah. Now, this isn't true for 100% of the time because it depends on what they're doing. But uh, the way that they would do it is they would make a character that would have an entire lower body and it has a rig that you can slide up and down. And the way that they did it back then was they would take these telescoping uh, brass tubes and they would drill a hole through the, the top tube and they would solder on a little, um, a little nut. Mm. And from there, uh, they would put in a, a set screw, and then the, the slider would just um, require that you loosen and tighten the screw to move the character up and down. That's so easy and genius. Yeah, it's, it's a simple thing, but you had to photograph it where you don't see the rig. <laughs> so, like, in a, in a scene where, uh, I think it's Adam and Eve, uh, Adam is sort of, like, running away in one shot, and, and the scene is, like, you know, four seconds long or so. And uh, there's also scenes like, or there's a, there's a close-up of him on a like a, a unicorn's back, and he's kind of galloping away. Um, but all the shots are close-up, and they they're using that very, very rig uh, underneath That's him, right. so you don't see it. But your your imagination fills in that oh, he must have legs, you know. Right. So. <laughs> That's so funny. So what if I want to do like a full? character shot with my very heavy clay guy walking like i've always just avoided it because it's so heavy <laughs> sure well what i did on zombie pirates is uh so i had to do some scenes where uh where ruble gets he gets blown up by a falling cannon off to the side of the shot and then he, he's standing up and he kind of loses his balance and uh, i was going to have him take a few steps so what I did in that case, which it didn't work out because my my armature broke, but um, but it kind of worked. <laughs> but I made the, this armature and I cast a, a liquid latex around it and painted it to look like clay. And I used a clay head so that you couldn't really tell that the whole thing was was changed for that shot. Um, so you know, using lighter materials if you're going to do something like that is is kind of the way to go. Uh, the other way is to cheat and to actually lay your your character down and uh, shoot it from the top, so that your like your whole set is on its side. Um, that's one way to do it. The other way is to use rigs, which are removed yeah. digitally. Um, so the the rig way is probably the way that most people would would want to do it. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> you are okay. Yeah. That's cool. Um, well, it's just I'm uh, setting myself up for a lot of post-production, unfortunately, which uh, is going to be a very interesting, probably like 20, 20 hours just sitting at a computer. <laughs> right. Um, so when you're on a set, like sometimes I've had uh, my cheap dollar store clay like melt on me because I'm using very hot lamps. I've got a desk lamp pretty close by. And if you watch some of my claymations you'll see like the character slowly gets sl like lower because he's melting <laughs> how do you get around that sure sure well that's that's always going to be a problem with clay um given that it is heavy and mm -hmm. like in the summertime if it's hot like if you're in a garage or something <clears throat> the other thing is that if you have like hot lights um and a computer running near everything, and it, that's hot. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe it's winter time, but the heat is on really high or something. You know, it's always going to end up where things are going to sag. Yeah. Um, so there, there's different ways that people try to solve that. And one, like I said, is to, to alter the clay by adding in, like, talcum powder, uh, making it a little bit more stiff. The other way is to make your armature more stiff. So... Depending on how you design it, if you're using, uh, for example, uh, well, aluminum wire is, is probably the, what most people will use. Um, so if you're using that and you're you're making twist of wire for the legs, uh, you might want to play around with using different diameter wire 
And if your puppet is able to be uh, upright without any problems with, let's say, two strands of 16th inch gauge wire, uh, you might want to add like another strand in there that's like one millimeter, just to make it a little bit more stiff than it needs to be. That makes sense. Um, so that that would kind of uh, you know change how much uh, force is required to bend things around. Um, so the other way and the more risky way is to make the the parts that bend the actual bending joints uh, more narrow. So I don't know if I can. I mean, so so let me backtrack a little bit. So if you make an armature, you want to make bones so that when you bend apart, it doesn't just turn into like a noodle. Um, so like if you bend an arm, you want to have an actual elbow, a yeah. wrist, you know, a shoulder. You don't want it to just be like a, a curve or something that's just like, oh, I'm going to move the hand and then it's just like like a lasso or something like that. So uh, when you make the joints, usually what you use is either you can take a wooden dowel rod and you can tie that to the parts to make the, uh, like a splint. Another way is to use your epoxy putty in those parts that make the bones. Or you can use uh, like the polymer clay we were talking about. You can you can add it to your armature, bake it, and it will become hard. And when you bend the armature, you know, it's like a bone. So when you do that, if you make the, the part in the arm, let's say, let's say the elbow, if you make that part wide, so there's a lot of wire in there and smaller bones, it will... It will bend at a gradual curve for the most part, but it won't hold up a lot of weight. But if you make the bones uh, closer to the joint and make that, that bendable area uh, area smaller, it actually is more stiff. So, so it's both good and bad because when you do that, the more stiff it is, the more likely it is to break. Um, so I would recommend always, you know, if you're going to, play around with it and trying to figure out how to make your character stand up is to add gradually more uh, strands of wire to your to your armature, basically. That makes a lot of sense. Um, next time I'm making a claymation, can you fly up to Toronto and just stand over me and give me all this advice while I'm doing stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you pay for the airplane ticket. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I have one more question, and it's something that's really annoying me right now. So I have this little wizard... Yeah silly wizard puppet that I'm making and he's made mostly out of felt and like a fish stick box but his face is clay and I've been animating with him over the period of like three weeks and a big problem that I'm experiencing is his face is like covered in dust and like little hairs and like I dropped it on the floor and it picked up everything on there and like I do my best to clean it off but if you look closely over the course of the shots he just gets dirtier and dirtier how yep. do you avoid just dust hitting the clay and sticking to it yep that's a big big problem in fact uh i mean no matter what you use if your if your puppet is silicone if it's latex if it's clay uh they all do have problems so this is not unique to clay uh but there is one thing you can try and yeah. you can first try to take some cold water and just rinse over the, the surface with cold water because it won't melt it. Uh, once it dries, you won't be able to tell it was wet. Um, that's the first thing I would try. But if the dirt is like literally pressed into, like in your case where you've dropped it, uh, <laughs> the dirt is like part of the clay, you know. Uh, so what they did, uh, you know, when I ever uh, asked about this was they, like at Wolf Hinton again, they would take like a tool, like a scraper tool, uh, usually made from wire, uh, and they would just find, like take it and just scrape over the surface to where just like a very super fine layer of clay would come off of there. Yeah. And once it was off, you could then take uh, some mineral oil. So I, I, like we mentioned that with the brush, but you can use your uh, finger in there as well. And just kind of smooth over it with mineral oil, and it will usually look like new <laughs> oh. for the most part. What is in it? What is in mineral oil that like different than something else that I might use? Is it just because it's clear? Yeah, uh, it's clear. So uh, it's also intrinsic to the clay. So most clays have some, some sort of oil in there in order to be smoothable because without it, it would be kind of... Um, so how can I explain this? Uh, so if you ever had like peanut butter that was really dry, mm -hmm. 
right? Like it's been sitting in the container for six months and you find it and you open it up and you look in there and it's kind of like cracking and dried out. Yeah. So it's the same premise. Uh, so they put oil in there so that everything is kind of smooth and you can sort of spread it on your bread and make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So with clay, if the oils um, were not in there, it would just kind of crumble. So they add that. And what you're doing is just dissolving the surface with the oil. Um, it's kind of like melting it chemically as opposed to with heat. That uh, makes sense. Um, do you see, I, I guess it's like all the kind of technical questions about clay and working with clay that I have, and I'm definitely going to change how I do things. So I'm really yeah. glad we had this chat. Do you see like a resurgence in claymation coming back in the industry at all? Well, it is, it actually is pretty big right now. Um, there's a, so it's big, but it's, how can I put this? Unless YouTube, uh, unless their algor algorithms, uh, present this to you, you wouldn't know that it's big. <laughs> uh, Wait, are you gonna, are you talking about those weird, like for children claymation things? Are you about to talk about that? <laughs> I am. Yes. Have you oh, seen no. those? <laughs> okay. Every, uh, maybe I'm not the only one that's been, uh, spanned by those, but, uh. Well, I feel like if I'm, if anybody's like constantly looking up claymation on YouTube, they come across them. There's so many of them and they're so strange. Yep. They are coming out of uh, mostly Vietnam, of all places. <laughs> so weird. So yes, they, the, the company, and I, unfortunately, I, don't, I can't remember the name of them, but they are in Vietnam, and they are a legitimate studio, and their whole premise is to, uh, to make these short clay animations based on Disney characters. Uh, there's like, uh, is it? What's that one character? Uh, Elsa? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Elsa and Hulk. There's a lot of and the Hulk. Yeah, I've seen a bunch Spider -Man. of Spider-Man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I wonder if they get away with, like, copyright infringement on that. Um, but I do think it's interesting because the quality of animation is actually really good. Like, I'm always surprised. I know yeah. they use, like, motion blurs and things like that to help uh, it look good. But, like, I'm always impressed at the stuff they build and the actual quality of the animation itself. Yeah, it, it's pretty good stuff. I mean, it's not really my my cup of tea. It's, you know, the no. whole, uh, you know, it's for like little babies and things like that, I guess. Yeah, but, their titles are like all caps, like Elsa <laughs> makes a doo-doo while grocery shopping. Like it's gonna be <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, yeah. yeah so besides, cool. besides those uh, weird YouTube algorithm uh, claymations, <laughs> Yeah, do yeah. You see it, do you see it coming back anywhere else? Like, well, yeah, like in, I, mean, I know Ardman is always doing a feature film, but um, like in studios, do you see it being used a lot? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> if I'm gonna be completely honest. <laughs> what do you think uh, it would take to get claymation back to the golden age of uh, the California raisins? Well, that was a question that Will Vinton himself was asked a lot. Uh, yeah. You know, are you gonna bring it back and everything like that and uh, so if, if I can recall, m most of his responses when he was asked that was along the lines of, you know, the tools today, it's not about the the technique so much, but it's more about the, the story and the characters. Yeah. Um, and in a way, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, people will gravitate towards a good story, no matter what, if it's hand-drawn if it's computers, if it's stop motion, if it's clay, you know, that that's really key is the story and relating to somebody that they're making a film from, essentially. Makes sense. So uh, maybe the resurgence just hasn't happened yet because nobody has taken the time to put a really good story behind claymation. Yeah. I mean, if you can make a good story with clay animation, you know, it's going to be rewarded for sure. Um, but I think that a lot of people nowadays are so bombarded with uh, CG that it's just like um, one of the things that I, I, I've seen over the years is how a lot of CG artists try to replicate making characters look like stop motion puppets. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, so I'm sure you've seen that yourself. And, and it's like, you know, it, I don't know, is it really... 
does it really matter that much? Does the the way it looks matter that much? I mean, it really comes down to personal preference. But, it, I mean, a lot of people love it. Like in the 80s, it was super popular. So there are people that love it and I think would embrace it if mm. the right person comes along and just decides, you know, we're going to make a feature and we're going to get, you know, funding for it. We're going to get good story writers and just do it. That makes sense. And yeah, I had a good chat with uh, Jay Van Ivey. He's a stop motion animator in, in Portland as well about why you should use stop motion over CG. Like, what's the point? And the, kind of what we talked about was like, st like to use to really use stop motion and maybe claymation at its heart. It's like you should use it for things that can't be replicated by CG or 2D or whatnot yet. So, um, yeah, I see a lot of CG trying to replicate stop motion characters. So maybe we just have to hold on for a little bit while uh before that feature film that uh you and i create with the great story comes out <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's totally possible uh i think that uh you know if you get somebody like neil gaiman or somebody like that you know the the writer for Coraline, mm -hmm. and uh you know the the talent out there unfortunately is um it's kind of not given an outlet like there's a lot of artists that have individual youtube channels that are great at doing clay animation and uh and stop motion and whatnot and you know they usually if they're really good they end up working for you know on robot chicken or someplace uh like shadow machine or or Leica, and uh and get kind of sucked into different uh techniques and not just clay right. um, yeah you're right. There is no like. Well, I guess maybe Ardman is still doing claymation, but um, we need that some more true. of those. So say so say you want to get into claymation. What are the opportunities right now? Is it is it kind of like do your own thing, put yourself online, uh, try to get uh, interest from your own work? Then would you say? Yeah, you know, I think like if someone's going to start out, if they're new to stop motion and they want to follow that path. <clears throat> So the, the thing that I would suggest, again, would be first, just, you know, if, if it's your first film, just try it out. Do it in a simple way. Mm -hmm. get, get a taste for it. If you're really into it, um, I would try to network with people locally that are artists and just see if they're interested in making a film with you. Yeah, because like a music video. I'm sorry? Uh, say like, a, like a music video. I've seen a lot of uh, artists, musicians have uh, claymation music videos now that I think about it. That's true. Yeah, uh, music videos, um, you know, small advertisements, like go to an ad agency and see if they need an ad made. Um, mm. I mean, you'd be surprised. Like there there are people that will pay you to do um, like a mascot for their car company or something. Um, huh. You know, like, uh, like a, you know, I don't know what's a what's a place like the the Springfield Hyundai or something like that, and just just talk to the owner and be like, hey, you know, if you're gonna make a commercial, I can you know spice it up and I can uh, superimpose my clay character driving down the street in your car and and or whatever you know and yeah. just see what happens. Um, like pitch stuff, get your get your ideas out there, pitch ideas to uh, uh, you know different companies, ad agencies, um, things like that. Uh, Make a short film with your friends, put it in a film festival, and get it out there as wide as you can. Sure. Yeah. Uh, there's that. There's that route. Um, there is, uh, you know, making a YouTube channel, making a few films. I mean, there, there's just so many opportunities with the internet uh, to do things like that now. Um, Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that kind of concludes everything that I wanted to ask you. Is there anything you wanted to add um, from our chat? Uh, let's see here. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking that, uh, you know, like people that when they start out in stop motion, uh, just be, you know, try to always be realistic with yourself yeah. and try and think ahead. Like a lot of a lot of people don't do that these days and end up in, in trouble. <laughs> so, like I said before, if you're going to make make your own studio or something, uh, make sure you have the money to do it first. Uh, make sure that you have maybe a client or somebody that you can make a stop motion uh, commercial for that has money that you can, you know, pay off your supplies and your equipment. Uh, you know, think big, but be realistic. 
it's it's very hard to make a living at it as i have tried <laughs> right. uh you know just kind of um but keep your doors open like be prepared for anything. That's probably the other thing I would tell people is that people will ask you for the weirdest stuff. Like uh, like just before, uh, in fact, I was um, I, I came on the, the podcast, I was standing on a, uh, a large fiberglass Buddha statue. <laughs> okay. Because the, there's a, a local uh, Buddhist temple that knows that I sculpt. Wow. And so they were like, hey, you know, they had their Buddha statue uh stolen from their their stu- their not studio their uh, their temple oh my and, gosh and it was like thrown out of a truck into a ditch and broken to pieces and uh the, the police department found it and they were like hey can you fix this for us so i'm like i can fix that for you <laughs> uh but it's like jobs kind of come out of out of nowhere like that and um try not to say no if you can because it might lead to something bigger than you're expecting yeah, that's true. I mean, connections in animation and stop motion I've, are so valuable. And and I've talked to a lot of stop motion animators on this podcast, and they pretty much all know each other and say, like, whenever there's a job, they just reach out to their current network. They don't even need to put in a resume or anything. So that, that makes that, a lot of sense to me. That's, that's totally true. <laughs> and what a random project you're working on. It's, it's really unfortunate <laughs> that that happened, but... Uh, also very interesting that you get to work on that too so that's cool yeah i mean it sounds weird but it's keeping me uh creative and busy you know and uh and i said why not you know so sure yeah. um and, and that's kind of like the attitude people should should try to have and uh yeah i guess that's pretty much it isn't it <laughs> yeah well thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and sharing all your wisdom um I feel like I was talking to an encyclopedia of uh, clay advice, which is amazing for me. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to give you some information. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and if you're listening and you want to follow Mark's work, you can check out his website, which is animate animateclay.com. And also just a reminder that if you're starting out in stop motion and you're looking for a good armature or rig or some stop motion software, you can head over to his website, which is also animateclay.com and use coupon code AIP to get 10% off any of his bendy armatures or rigs and a copy of Stop Motion Pro software. And uh, that's all for now. So thank you for listening. Okay, bye.